Welcome to our lecture on sex and gender and psychopharmacology. I'm Dr. Elaine Orabona Foster, and I have been a prescribing psychologist for about 20 years now. I've discovered in my practice that this topic is a critical one, and I hope to convince you by the end of this lecture that it will be just as important to your practice. Let's start by an overview of the course today, which, of course, will have an introduction and important elements of psychopharmacology, because as you'll see later on, the distinction in terms of the sex and psychopharmacology, pharmacokinetics, dynamics, are going to be critical in this topical area. Then we're going to look at some sex-specific disorders, followed by hormonal contraceptives, which I have given its own category because of the importance of monitoring and asking about it while treating women. Then, of course, the ever-changing area of pregnancy and lactation. And then finally, we'll wrap up. So what's the difference? Sex, gender, they're used interchangeably. But for scientists, they have a very important distinction. So sex is what you probably already think of it as, biological. It includes the sex chromosomes, the gonads, internal reproductive organs, and external genitalia. Gender on the other hand, is a social construct. And so it has to do with the feelings, the norms, the cultural mores beyond a person's biological sex, but of course, as a consequence of their sex. And that's why I put um, those pictures up for you to remember sex in that first um, anatomy diagram or pictorial and then kind of the cute picture underneath where we already start to distinguish in newborns the gender so that you see the, the male with a bow tie. So we expect a male to have a certain look. And then the little girl or the baby female with the pink hat. And that has to do with our expectations about gender. I thought I would start with this slide as an overview of the pharmacokinetics slash anatomical differences between the sexes. And I think the difference is most striking in terms of total body water. So we know that men and women weigh on average you know, differently, so that men weigh more, they have more lean muscle mass, whereas women have a higher fat to lean muscle mass than men. But take a look at that total body water. It looks like men have quite a bit more, about a third more, and that's going to play out later on when we begin to talk about pharmacokinetic differences between the sexes. So that if an average male and an average female are exposed to the same dose of a water-soluble drug, that greater total body water is going to make a big difference in terms of the volume of distribution. And in hydrophilic drugs, it's going to decrease that drug concentration for the male differently than it will for the female. Um, and where does that play out maybe um, significantly within our practice? Think about ethanol or alcohol. That is a substance that we know has mind-altering uh, effects and it is also hydrophilic, so that if an individual, let's say a male, has a, an average ounce of alcohol versus a woman, 
that concentration is going to be higher in the female and therefore have greater effects. And we know in general that women do tend to respond uh, differently to alcohol, uh, given that tolerances you know, are the same. So um, let's move on and look at some of the other differences. We have these differences in life expectancies. Women, on, uh, in general, tend to live longer than men. And this diagram also breaks it out by uh, white and black male and females. But as you see here, the white female has the longest lifespan. And in fact, the white male approximates the lifespan of the black female, the female still being higher. And then the, the poor black male at the bottom has the lowest life expectancy. Uh, but the important thing for you to recognize is that these uh, are uh, very well-known differences in terms of lifespan and the sexes. This is a chart showing the incidence of sudden death in men and women and how, of course, it increases with age, but you see that uniformly, men are more likely to die of sudden death by about twice as much um, across the lifespan. And that's why you'll hear this saying that men die from disease while women live with disease. In fact, uh, I thought this was an interesting little factoid that 66% of females are centarians. So that's two-thirds uh, of centarians are women. And now let's get at the meat of what we're interested in as prescribing psychologists or as uh, consultants. We see that at early ages, during childhood, there's very little difference. In fact, you might argue that males are more often prescribed medications than females. And that might be because of you know, things like ADHD and some of the more aggressive behaviors that we'll see in boys than are typically exhibited in girls. But now let's move up to what happens during adulthood. And now you see that women far surpass males in terms of the percentage or number of prescriptions that are used to treat them. And so this includes antidepressants, antipsychotics, and anti-anxiety medications. Um, our psychotropics, we know that women in general are given more prescriptions than men. So why does this happen? Are women just inherently sicker, more mentally compromised than men? Well, I have this quote here that's by the World Health Organization, and it says that doctors are more likely to diagnose depression in women compared with men, even when they have similar scores on standardized measures of depression or present with identical symptoms. So why are women more likely to be diagnosed? And why are they more likely to be given that prescription by the end of the clinical encounter? Well, there are some popular hypotheses about this. They include the morbidity hypothesis, uh, reporting hypothesis, and then just plain old stereotyping a prescribing bias. Let's look at each one and see what convinces us. We know that epidemiological studies, not only in the US, but worldwide, consistently show a higher incidence of mood and anxiety disorders in women compared to men. In other words, this morbidity hypothesis says that 
women are more likely, because of their biology, to suffer from disease at a higher rate than men. What would be the difference? The obvious difference is that they have different sex hormones. We know that these hex sex hormones, for example, estrogen, uh, estradiol, progesterone, uh, are higher in women, and they fluctuate across the lifespan and even across the menstrual cycle. Brain regions, especially those that are more associated with neuroplasticity, like the amygdala. So when we think of amygdala, we think of kind of that fear response, um, anxiety. The hypothalamus, which is associated with that HPA axis, hypothalamus pituitary adrenal uh, axis. But then also there's the hype, uh, hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis. And then, of course, the hippocampus, which is associated with our memories and particularly associated with post-traumatic stress disorder. So we know that they uh, are affected in terms of their densities um, and their neuroplasticity, as we said, particularly through brain-derived neurotrophic factor by hormones like estrogen and progesterone. And could that be a reason why we start to see these differences in terms of mental disorders? Here's a slide that I thought might help you to see visually the idea of how this morbidity hypothesis might play out throughout the life cycle of, a, of an average woman. So for example, we see that there's the estrogen plasma concentration that you see there at the top. And we see prevalence rates for depression in percentages below that. Isn't it remarkable that they seem to mirror each other? And you might say the same thing, not just for estrogen, but some of the other um, sex hormones. And the idea being that maybe these two are linked, this, this kind of mental, uh, change, emotional changes, along with these changes in hormones. And then we see how it drops postmenopausally, which is the time when a woman, a woman is showing the greatest decrease in these distinctive sexual hormones. Now let's move on to another hypothesis. It's called the reporting hypothesis, and it has to do with the idea that maybe women are just more comfortable reporting their symptoms. Morbidity studies often rely on self-report measures. Um, we know, you know, the Hamilton D, the Beck Depression Inventory, the Beck Anxiety Inventory. These are all based on self-report, and we know that women because of gender, remember we said that there are these social norms uh, that are consistent between the sexes, they are changing more now, thankfully. But we can say that in general, given the social mores, that women are uh, not maligned for sharing emotions in the same way that a man or a male is. You know, the idea of a male crying is still considered um, somewhat uh, anathema within our culture and in many cultures. So we know that men are less likely to report mood-based symptoms. They're also more likely to be diagnosed with alcoholism and antisocial personality disorders and to suffer from what is called alexithymia, um, 
Ron Levant was a great um, explicator of the concept of alexithymia. But the idea being that men are, have more difficulty labeling their emotions. And so maybe they experience just as much depression, but instead it is expressed via other venues like excessive alcohol use or uh, anger discontrol. I decided to take a look at some of the advertising to help you understand this idea of the next hypothesis, which is called stereotyping hypothesis. And that has to do with the messages in particular that prescribers, because that's what we're talking about, prescribers behaving differently with one sex versus another. And so here I've, I've gotten kind of a compilation of pictures from advertisements that are used to solicit prescribing patterns or to uh, uh, affect prescribing patterns across physicians or uh, other prescribers. And you see here under, could it be ADHD, we have two women, one man. Under the other, uh, under the Rixalti advertisement, you see that again, there's two women and you might say, well, the other woman isn't really important. She's looking away from the camera. I'll give you that. Um, and the other man looking away from the camera, we, they've got their backs to us, but who's the focal point in that picture? It's the woman who's holding up the little smiley face and you can tell she's not smiling. So here again, we have this idea that women are more at risk even if it's a subtle subliminal message, we start to incorporate in our mindset, our framework of, of, of disease, that women are more likely to suffer from these conditions. Which is kind of interesting because in the early years, we already said that males are more likely to suffer from ADHD. Here's just another medley. Uh, because I really wanted to drive home this point that if you look at the various advertisements, you see that women predominate when it comes to this idea of depression and mood instability. Uh, there's kind of a funny one there about Prozac as a cleaning agent. It says, wash your blues away. And it's a woman in kind of a stereotypical 50s garb washing her blues away with this Prozac. Why isn't there a man in front of that detergent box? Um, again, subtle messages affecting our prescribing habits. And then this is the last one. It's older, um, but it gets back, same thing. I got my mommy back. Well, why didn't he get his, his daddy back? There's just these messages in the Remeron. There's two women again, two to one, uh, and also in the antipsychotic advertisement, two to one. Do you think that would affect the way that a doctor or prescriber thinks about the person that's sitting in front of them in that clinical encounter? So again, with this stereotyping hypothesis, physicians work under the model of pathology with the expression of negative emotions like nervousness, worry, sadness, tearfulness, as signs of dis-ease. Whereas the male having that stoic stiff upper lip being the more common expression of normalcy. And if you want to send a doctor to his prescription or her prescription pad in minutes, um, just put a patient in the room crying and having a panic attack. Uh, 
Um, in all fairness, primary care doctors do have 15 minute appointments and many don't have the luxury of a behavioral, spe behavioral health specialist um, integrated into their practice. So many times the easiest way to end that encounter in a state of, of, of emotionality is to go ahead, write the prescription and say, this will make you feel better. And that's why I included this cartoon, because uh, the doctor here is saying, I'd like to slap your face, tell you to stop complaining, and send you on your way. But instead, here's something to help you rest. Call me if you're not better by my Wednesday. Uh, so we know that the idea is that this doctor is hearing people complain all day long. And if there's a way to kind of scurry them out um, without saying, listen, why don't you do something about this in terms of your lifestyle or habits or exercise? Um, they may do that, but many times they see it as too much of an uphill battle. They pull out that prescription pad and have a nice day. Call me if you're not better. Let's look at some pharmacological uh, sex differences in terms of uh, just now moving, let's say, from the kind of social aspect of the differences to the impact of those prescriptions on individuals. So for example, we know that women develop more adverse effects from drugs, including fatalities from the medicines they're prescribed, than do men. And in fact, eight out of 10 drugs were withdrawn from the market between 1997 and 2001 due to that greater risk in women. Many times the dosages are not specific to women. They're kind of averaged out with males dominating in studies. In fact, it was only 19, uh, starting in the late 1990s, I think it was 99, that women had to be included in drug studies. So the dosing becomes an issue because they're more often based on an average of a male pharmacology. We know that um, there is greater bioavailability. You're going to see why that is later as we get into the kinetics and dynamics. And there may be some differences in terms of women's reactions to drugs based on these kind of receptor number and binding issues that we talked about earlier related to the sex hormones. It may be that women are more experientially sensitive to drug effects. And then of course, if women are prescribed more medications, then they are likely to have more impact from polypharmacy. So that additive effect that we often see when multiple drugs are prescribed. It can not only be an additive effect, it may be um, the inhibition or induction that occurs in our liver enzymes when we have drugs that are metabolized through the same substrates. So let's go on and take a look at the pharmacology. Just a quick recall that uh, pharmacokinetics has to do with what the body does to the drug. It consists of the, what we use an acronym called ADME, which has to do with absorption, distribution, metabolism, and elimination. So we know that in order for a drug to work, it has to reach the right target, which in our case, in the CNS, the receptors are typically receptors like serotonin, uh, glutamate, GABA, norepinephrine. Um, so it has to reach those targets in the right concentration. 
too much and you'll get adverse effects, too little and you may not get any effect. Then of course the other side of pharmacokinetics, uh, I, I'm sorry, of pharmacology is pharmacodynamics and that has to do with what the drug does to the body. And so in other words, when we give a drug, it has what's called the mechanism of action. It has to work in a particular part of the body in order to exert its effects. This slide is something that I hope you keep as a type of summary reminder of the differences between the sexes in terms of drug effects. We know that women show, in general, higher drug concentrations. That can be reflected through CMAX and the area under the curve. We see that both are higher. And the conclusion is that at a given dose, a drug reaches higher free drug concentration, as in that CMAX, and or it can remain in the system longer in females, as we see, because the area of, of under the curve is associated with not only the concentration, but time and concentration. Here's another important difference, the QT interval. We know that it has to be corrected for uh, differences in heart rate, otherwise um, prolonged QT intervals at faster heart rates wouldn't be recognized. So we see that the corrected uh, QT is longer on average in women which may explain their higher rates of fatal arrhythmias. We know that many of our psychotropics have what are called quinidine-like effects, which means that it prolongs that QT interval. And if you prolong that for an uh, abnormally long uh, extended period, then you are at risk of causing torsades de point in that patient. And so there you see in that uh, graphic the uh, difference in terms of the, the normal and then that longer QT that you might see on average in women. Now this is the start of a set of pharmacokinetic slides that have to do with that ADME that we were talking about and how it affects the uh, drug concentrations. So it's across the female lifespan. And as you see, it goes from childhood changes all the way through to the elder years. Remember that in order for a drug to enter the systemic circulation, it has to go into the body somehow. The majority of the drugs that we use, about what, 95% of our drugs are taken orally, uh, and that may be sublingually, but mostly the drugs are swallowed. That is the beginning of the absorption process. So we can talk about different forms of absorption, but why? We mostly give oral drugs, so let's stick with that right now in order to understand these changes with um, absorption in women. The pill is swallowed. It is going to go down through the esophagus and uh, go through the transit system to get to uh, uh, the liver, which we know metabolizes our drugs. But before it can do that, it has to um, be absorbed mostly through the small intestine, the duodenum, is where most of our drugs are absorbed. And we know that absorption is an important issue because many times um, the drug concentration is affected by absorption uh, for the most part. So why do we tell patients with some drugs that they need to take it on an empty stomach versus taking it on a full stomach or with food, uh, with fatty foods. It's because it's affecting the drug's absorption. Now, we see that typically for women, 
gastric emptying time is lower than men up until the time that we get to those elder years. And we already talked about this. The sex hormones begin to um, become more neutral compared to the earlier years. And so isn't it interesting that we see these kind of approximations back to what looks more like an equal um, absorption between men and women during those elder years. But in general, we can say that gastric and thing times are lower for women. And notice on that last segment that it shows that women also have uh, lower uh, levels of alcohol dehydrogenase which again can affect the impact of alcohol. In other words, raising that drug concentration level of alcohol in females and enhancing that uh, effect of intoxication. After a drug is absorbed, it has to be distributed. It has to go to where that drug is meant to go. It was designed with a mechanism of action. So we see that there are increased volume of distribution for hydrophilic drugs um, during the menstrual cycle because of some increase in total body water, which you would expect during uh, the, the menses. And then um, during pregnancy, you see that there is an increase in blood volume there is increased crossover between fetal and maternal bloodstreams. And then we're kind of back to going down um, in terms of volume of distribution for hydrophilic drugs during the elder years. Interestingly, we see also an increase at that same time in the volume of distribution for lipophilic drugs like our benzodiazepines, which can accumulate over time, or drugs like marijuana. Again, they just sequester themselves in those fatty stores and um, are likely to increase their half-lives because of that sequestration. And that's more likely, as you see, to happen during the elder years. Let's move on to distribution. Once the drug is absorbed, it needs to go somewhere. The idea is that the mechanism of action is uh, one of the ways that we know where it is going to be distributed to. But drugs can be hydrophilic or lipophilic. Remember, hydrophilic means water-loving, lipophilic meaning fat-loving. What would you expect in terms of the overall changes or differences between men and women in terms of these two compartments of distribution? Well, if you said that you expect women to show a higher volume of distribution for lipophilic drugs, you would be right because we already said that women in general tend to have more fat to lean muscle ratio than do men. Therefore, drugs that are fat loving are going to have a nicer home in the female body. Why do we care about that? Because we know that if a drug is sequestered in fat, it can last longer. In other words, the uh, T half can be longer because of it. The half-life being longer means that the drug stays in the body and the effect may last longer. What kinds of drugs that we prescribe would be important to think about that or consider that for? Drugs like the benzodiazepines which over time can accumulate and become toxic if taken in high doses. The other probably one that you may not think about very much is marijuana. Again, a lipophilic drug whose half-life can be extended. 
The um, other changes are probably uh, things that you would expect. In other words, increased blood volume, um, decreased serum albumin. Remember that albumin um, is kind of the mechanism for transport for many of our drugs. And therefore, if let's say during pregnancy, you have a decrease in serum albumin, that means you have more free drug. Free drug means drug that is free to exert its effects, sometimes for the good, other times for the toxic. And then, of course, we know that there is a crossover between uh, fetal and maternal bloodstreams. So distribution becomes an important pharmacokinetic element when we think about these differences between the sexes. Now we're up to metabolism. I'm not going to go into a great deal of specificity on this slide because there are so many things that can affect metabolism that I don't think it's fair to use uh, the sex hormones as the main uh, differentiator. So what I will say, though, is that in general, in young women, the liver enzyme, cytochrome P450-3A4, tends to be more active. What does that mean? That means that drugs like the mood stabilizers in particular, but really 60% of our drugs, which are metabolized to 3A4, are going to be uh, more likely to have lower levels and therefore have uh, less effect, all things being equal, in women. But remember that it can also include the antidepressants, the anxiolytics, and other drugs. Finally, we come to the phase of elimination. So once a drug has been swallowed, gone through absorption, been distributed to the different compartments in the body, and then biotransformed through the liver, mostly through um, first pass effect, it has to be eliminated. How does that happen? We already know from f earlier classes that drugs have to become hydrophilic in order to be eliminated through the kidneys. How is a drug uh, measured in terms of the speed by which the, the flow of that drug being eliminated through the kidneys is done? through GFR. So we see that in uh, various times during the life cycle, the GFR does change. And that means that the speed or rate at which the kidneys filter waste from the blood is going to change. Remember that GFR is a measure of how blood passes through the glomerular system each minute. Usually, a drug's renal clearance is proportional to the patient's renal function. Whether a drug's dosing rate needs to be modified in patients with renal dysfunction depends on how that drug is excreted through the kidneys. And that's why we want to know about GFR and kidney function. We see here that, in general, there is a lower creatinine clearance in females and that it does change during the uh, lifespan. So for example, we see that in the luteal phase, which is when we are most likely to see the premenstrual dysphoric disorder, that there's an increase in GFR. But there's a decrease during the early follicular phase. And then during pregnancy, increased blood flow means increased GFR. That's, again, going to be important for drugs, for example, like lithium, although later on we're going to see why we probably would not be prescribing lithium to a pregnant female, uh, to a 
a pregnant woman. Um, but there are some factors that we'll have to consider. Let's move on to the other element of, pharmaco uh, of pharmacology, pharmacodynamics. We know that the mechanism of action is going to tell us most about a drug's pharmacodynamics. And here we see that women more than men are likely to have endocrine-related adverse effects. What are those endocrine adverse effects? Well, effects like hyperprolactinemia, hyponatremia, diabetes, hypothyroid, hyperparathyroid, sexual dysfunction, and metabolic syndrome. In general, we already know, you've probably learned this through other classes, that women, when they experience depression, are more likely to have some form of a thyroid dysfunction. So we're already used to looking at endocrine action in women. These are other elements that we need to pay attention to. In addition, we know and have said earlier that there are interaction effects due to women being prescribed more medications. We can have an additive effect, so for example, multi-anxiety agents causing sedation. And then we can also have antagonistic effects like contraceptives being combined with other drugs that can reduce their effectiveness. When we reduce effectiveness in a contraceptive agent, it's not like reducing the effectiveness of a cough suppressant. When the oral contraceptive or any contraceptive is reduced in if its efficacy, you may be looking at a lawsuit because an individual, a woman or her family was counting on her not being able to um, get pregnant. And yet, because of some prescribing mistakes, perhaps not giving her full informed consent, she becomes pregnant unintentionally. And we know that this happens that more often than not, women become pregnant unintentionally than intentionally. Let's move on to the drug classes. Antidepressants. We see that women are more likely to respond to SSRIs. There's been some controversy about this because some studies have suggested that this is not um, universally replicated. And so take it with a grain of salt. But we do know that bupropion increases risk seizure in women with bulimia. And of course, that's one of the potential contraindications to using this drug with women who um, suffer from eating disorders. And then men are more likely to benefit from tricyclic antidepressants. Of course, we don't use TCAs very often now because of their risk in, uh, at high doses. But um, it's kind of an old lore but the take-home message is still important for that second bullet, which says that older men are more likely to suffer from urinary hesitancy. So the drugs that we prescribe that are anticholinergic are going to be big players when it comes to men and aging and that urinary hesitancy that we often see. Then both men and women do suffer from decreases in bone mineral density. Yes, we're used to thinking of osteoporosis more often in older women, but I want you to see this chart that shows that there is a decline, especially for women, um, menopausally and then postmenopausally, such that their risk for fracture increases. And we know that if an elderly individual falls, they're more likely to break their hip, 
which then increases their chances of death. So if we see that SSRIs have a tendency to cause decrease in bone mineral density, we really want to pay attention to that. Yes, in women postmenopausally, but just as much, I would argue, for men in their elder years. And here's a list. I don't expect to go over all of these with you during this class, but it's there for you to use as a reference. And I'll just point out that you'll probably notice that we see that there is an overall trend toward decreased metabolism, decreased clearance, and higher blood levels in women across the span of many antidepressant medications. You see uh, under the SSRIs that there is an increased plasma level in uh, younger women than in men. So that's kind of an unusual thing. But the SSRIs, they have such a large um, therapeutic index that um, it probably is not going to make much of a difference in terms of your clinical practice unless you're talking about the early phases of treatment when we are subject to uh, the causing side effects through the dosing of our drugs. And uh, I'll just point out again with bupropion that there is that increased seizure risk in women. Moving on to somnolence. The FDA announced its first sex-specific dosing guidelines for a psychotropic with the use of Ambien. So I usually use the generic name of a drug, so I apologize here. It should say Zolpidem, but whether it's Zolpidem or Ambien, you're going to see that, they, that it, this drug is twice as potent for women. And the FDA's drug safety communication for 2013 on this drug said, quote, the recommended initial dose of certain immediate release Zolpidem products like Ambien and Edgelar, Luar, is five milligrams for women and either five milligrams or 10 milligrams for men. So that can be twice the dose. The recommended initial dose of Zolpidem extended release or Ambien CR is 6.25 for women and then either 6.25 or 12.5 milligrams for men. Again, you see um, a significant dosing difference. But I thought I would at least add this other significant qualifier for men with regard to Zolpidem, and that is that suicidality is greater with this drug in males than women. The other thing I was reading recently that I thought was interesting is that at post-midnight dosing of Zolpidem, women will show greater impairment in their driving ability than men. Antipsychotics. Oh, uh, just a quick thing that I will say. Remember, we're talking about Ambien or Zolpidem, but you could make this argument for any one of the Z drugs, um, Esopiclone um, and others, because of the fact that they have the same mechanism of action. And you would expect that drugs that have the same mechanism of action will show the same types of potency issues. Um, let me retract that. We'll show the same kinds of adverse effects, not potency issues, because potency is a separate um, pharmacokinetic principle. But now let's move on to the antipsychotics. We know that estrogen may have antidopaminergic properties because it binds to the dopamine receptor. How does this affect 
women in particular compared to uh, men. And I'm sorry, because that slide shows W greater than F, and uh, it really should say F greater than M. So F being females, M being men. What kinds of adverse effects do we see? Well, women tend to show more weight gain and therefore metabolic syndrome with the use of antipsychotics. They also tend to experience hyperprolactinemia more often than men. However, uh, men are more distressed by hyperprolactinemia, as you would expect. And then we already said this earlier, that there is this greater risk for torsades de point based on that extended QT interval that we see in women. And then estrogen, um, we already said, may have those anti-dopaminergic properties. So the take-home message here is that we will, all things being equal, we will see more adverse effects when using antipsychotics with women versus with men. You see here in this slide that we have significantly higher plasma concentrations of antipsychotics in the form of chlorpromazine, flufenazine, olanzapine, and clozapine. So we want to be watchful about that. And in cases where we can do therapeutic drug monitoring, it would be advisable, especially if we have complaints of side effects. We also know, I think this will come in a later slide, uh, that women tend to suffer more from dyskinesias than do men. So the extra pyramidal symptoms of our antipsychotics are more likely to be experienced at higher levels with women. But then we also see that men can require up to two times the uh, dose compared to women when it comes to the maintenance of antipsychotics. Let's look at the mood stabilizers. Men are more likely to experience tremor with lithium treatment. Women require folate supplementation, or at least it's recommended for women of childbirth age. We'll talk more about why that's the case later on. But really, in your mind, whenever you think of mood stabilizers in the anti-seizure class, you really should be thinking about um, tubal, uh, neural tube defects like spina bifida, and that's the reason why we look at folate supplementation. Women are more likely to develop hypothyroidism with lithium. Remember, we said that they, in general, will show more endocrine effects, adverse endocrine effects from the drugs that we prescribe. And so, uh, it says factor most predictive of hypothyroidism was weight gain during that first year of lithium use. Something to keep in mind. And then anti-seizure medications like carbamazepine, oxcarbazepine, and topiramate may lower the efficacy of oral contraceptives. Again, a critical issue when it comes to helping a woman to not only stay mood stable, but also to uh, avoid an unwanted pregnancy. Here's a case example I threw in just to keep it interesting. Susan is a 25-year-old female who comes to see you after her visit to the ER last night for panic symptoms. She was given diazepam and told to take it as needed for anxiety. She tells you she almost got into an accident on her way to the appointment because she felt so drowsy she could not maintain her concentration on the road. What would you want to ask her to help you understand 
why this happened, and how would you try to explain what might have happened to Susan? We know that panic disorder happens more often with women, um, whether you subscribe to any one of the uh, three um, hypotheses about why this happens, we know it to be epidemiologically a fact that women have panic more often than men. Now let's look at the way benzodiazepines, which are primarily, uh, I shouldn't say primarily, which are often used to treat panic disorder, are, are um, differently absorbed and so on uh, in the case of women. So we see that mostly there is a tendency for decreased clearance with increased blood levels across many of the benzodiazepines. We know that Susan was taking diazepam or Valium and that again it tends to show decreased clearance with increased blood levels but look at that last part, that there are decreased clearance and increased psychomotor and cognitive problems when combined with oral contraceptives. So all things being equal, we're going to assume that diazepam, which can be sedating for anyone, but at higher levels is going to have more sedation because Susan is female, but now, if she is also on an oral contraceptive, she is more likely to experience those adverse effects. And perhaps we might ask, she says, yes, I, was on, I am on an oral contraceptive. And perhaps that's the reason why she got into a car accident on her way to your appointment. Hopefully, uh, you looked at that before you decided to prescribe the diazepam for her panic disorder, and she had the informed consent necessary in order to uh, make a good decision about whether that was really the best drug to use in her case. Now let's look at the sex-specific disorders. We're going to start with premenstrual dysphoric disorder. So in other words, these are conditions that are commonly seen within one sex versus the other. Premenstrual dysphoric disorder is sometimes considered the fourth vital sign in women's health. And the reason for that is because it can have such an impact on chronic conditions. For example, migraines, asthma, seizure disorder, irritable bowel syndrome, diabetes, chronic fatigue, allergies, and autoimmune disorders. So we might want to keep those in mind in particular because if a woman, for example, comes in and complains of some increase in epileptic activity, you might be the clinical detective that solves the case by looking at whether there was any relationship to her menses. Many people don't stop to think about the uh, course of the menstrual cycle and the significant impact it can have on these kinds of conditions. I tossed in the uh, calendar cartoon because I think it depicts kind of a, a comical way of thinking about the course of premenstrual dysphoric disorder. So we see in that calendar that she has beware on the week prior to the actual menses, where you see kind of the sad face. Um, so about a week before that sad face, um, she is saying beware because these are when the symptoms are most likely to occur. 
the uh, diagnosis of premenstrual dysphoric disorder is dependent on various symptoms, whether they be depressive, anxiety, or physical. In order to be diagnosed with PMDD, it has to interfere with social, occupational, or sexual, or school function. It cannot merely be a worsening of a pre-existing mood or anxiety disorder or personality disorder. As we said, it will begin approximately one week and remit within a few days after the onset of menses. That is the hallmark of the premenstrual dysphoric disorder. So we know that it is happening during that late luteal phase. And uh, according to DSM, the symptoms must be prospectively confirmed. Many times that doesn't happen, but it's really um, something to keep in mind in terms of the legitimacy of the diagnosis. And then let's look at what causes it. It uh, obviously has to do with a fluctuation in the ovarian steroids. But as we said earlier, those steroids can have a significant impact on neurotransmitters. And therefore, it can affect mood, anxiety. You see there, it affects serotonergic, adrenergic, opioid, GABAergic systems. There can also be a genetic predisposition toward these premenstrual symptoms. And then social expectations. So what does the society suggest in terms of how a woman either um, should, shouldn't, or is expected to behave under the conditions of the menstrual cycle? This is a graph to help you reorient in terms of understanding the menstrual cycle. So uh, in women, the uh, period shows a variation in hormones, um, and of course, most importantly, fertility over the course of 28 days. You see that, uh, well, just as a reminder, we know that the anterior pituitary releases follicle-stimulating hormone, or FSH, the FSH promotes the growth of a follicle in the ovary. So you see that at the very top, you see the uh, follicular phase, which is, begins with the onset of menstruation. And that follicle is growing or evolving over the course of that follicular phase. And there is the period of actual ovulation where the follicle has um, nurtured to the point that it is then ex expelled. And that is obviously the time that a woman is uh, likely to become pregnant. You see there in the um, hormonal section of that graphic, that there is that rise in luteinizing hormone right at the point just before ovulation. And that's what ovulation predictors rely on in order to give feedback about a woman's readiness for pregnancy. So uh, with that, that bolus of uh, luteinizing hormone, we know that she is uh, likely to become pregnant. And then after that, we see the luteinizing hormone decreases dramatically. But during that luteal phase, the second half, which is when we are likely to see the premenstrual dysphoric symptoms, toward the end of that luteal phase, we start to see an increase in progesterone and an increase in estradiol. 
uh, I'm sorry, a, D, a kind of like just a, a baseline or averaging of estradiol. But the reason that I want to call your attention to that progesterone rise is because that has been theorized to be one of the main uh, culprits in the mood instability and depressive mood that uh, we will see in women during that late luteal phase. Let's see, is there anything else that uh, I want to point out? Just to remind you again that with the start of menses and the reorienting of those hormones, you should see if it is truly a premenstrual dysphoric disorder, you should see a return to normalcy within about a day or two. And this is hard to see. You don't need to see it. It's just my way of reminding you that there are many instruments available to you uh, to do that prospective analysis of the symptoms required in order to meet criteria for postmenstrual dysphoric disorder. This one happens to be a uh, daily record of severity of problems. But again, you can find uh, many of these just online. What are the treatments? If you've been a prescriber as long as I have, you'll notice that treatments tend to change um, in terms of empirically validated um, agents used to treat PMDD. But for the most part, we continue to say that the SSRIs do have the greatest empirical support. You see uh, here that it has an evidence rating of A, and that's based on 40 random controlled uh, studies or trials. The, um, I, I taught a continuing education class once on the treatment of PMDD, and I literally had some obstetricians um, and primary care doctors rapidly disagree with me because their first line of defense in treating um, PMDD was to use oral contraceptives. In particular, Yaz even has an indication for PMDD. And so how can you argue? But I would argue because of something I'm going to show you in a little bit. There's also the use of calcium supplementation, which many suggest as first line, along with lifestyle. We know that exercise and diet can have a significant impact on those PMDD mood symptoms. And there's really nothing wrong with using calcium supplementation um, as some of your first line defenses. But here's my argument for why if you have a true case of PMDD, you may want to consider an SSRI if um, there are no contraindications. And it has to do with a, um, a particular patient that I use as my kind of sentinel um, case study. She is or was a 28-year-old white married female. She was referred to me by a social worker. And she had symptoms five to seven days prior to menses, as we would expect with an individual who does suffer from PMDD. Her symptoms were psychological in terms of uh, depression and irritability. She said, quote, I just get really moody, angry, and weepy. She had nervousness, so those anxiety symptoms, tension, inability to relax. And then she had physical symptoms by way of cramping, breast bloating, and breast tenderness and headache. I uh, started her on 50 milligrams of sertraline on day one of her menses. You don't need to understand all of those symptoms. What I want you to do here is to kind of look at the big picture. 
So big picture is that she's got all of these symptoms that occur about the week prior to her menstrual, uh, her menses. And we see that for two months in a row. And then, uh, okay, she had a little um, snippet of irritability um, on the 24th day, but that's just normal. Uh, you know, we all have days where we might have that. Um, but then look at what happens on the, look at the, the um, second column. I don't know if you can see it very clearly, but that first day of her menses has an asterisk over it. So it would be number six on the second column. That was the day that we started her on the sertraline. And as you can see, the rest of the next month is clear. And the take home point on this is that by the next cycle, her only menstrual symptoms were mild cramps and breast tenderness one day prior to menses. We're not used to thinking of our drugs other than the benzodiazepines um, and some very few others as having such a quick impact. And yet, in the case of PMBD, we see that, the, that an SSRI has almost immediate, within days, impact on the disorder. Here are the take-home points. SSRIs improve symptoms more quickly in PMDD than in depression, so don't confuse them. Just because you're treating what looks like um, sadness, um, but you've already prospectively dis determined is PMDD, it is going to respond much sooner to your SSRI than depression would. And because of that, you do not have to take the drug every day in order for it to have a significant effect on those premenstrual dysphoric symptoms. There is something called uh, intermittent or late luteal phase dosing. It can be done uh, 14 days in advance of the menses, just after ovulation. Um, it can um, really depend on um, how clean those PMDD symptoms are. So for example, if you have someone who typically suffers from depression, but now she gets worse during that late luteal phase, you don't want to use the kind of um, intermittent or late luteal phase dosing because now you're going to um, not be treating the, uh, tr the depression that underlies that PMDD. But if you are purely treating PMDD, then what a great way to minimize the, the use of a drug that could potentially have other adverse effects. Like remember we said that it can reduce um, bone mineral density in long-term or chronic use. So if you don't have to use it chronically, why? Why do it? Um, we know that women tend to have, and we don't know why, but they tend to have less withdrawal symptoms when it's used in this dosing regimen for PMDD. So that's another factor that allows us to consider this um, course of dosing. Let's go on to priapism. A university psychiatrist diagnosed a student, Quentin, with generalized anxiety disorder. She prescribed trazodone for insomnia, which he took for three weeks. At, this next at his next appointment, Quentin reported that the trazodone did alleviate the insomnia and that he felt more rested. <laughs> 
As a result, he stopped taking the medication. Now Quentin, though, comes back in. Um, he didn't tell the psychiatrist that he had also experienced an uncomfortable erection while he was taking the trazodone. The erection lasted about four hours. It was not related to sexual activity while taking the trazodone. He was able to resolve it on his own with some cold showers. He, um, as we said, did not inform the psychiatrist because he was embarrassed to tell her about it. So we're asking in this case of the hardly anxious student what condition Quentin was describing, why we think he developed this condition, and then how would you counsel him about continuing or not continuing to use a drug like trazodone? We know or hopefully have guessed that Quentin was describing priapism. It is a sustained painful erection. In order to understand priapism, I am including this graphic here, or um, this illustration, to help you see that the kind of the take home message that I want you to understand, because I'm not going to go over the biology of an erection, as much as to say that that area uh, uh, called the corpus cavernosum, okay, or cave like body, um, is the tissue, it's a spongy tissue that becomes engorged with blood during erection. The problem is that the blood flows in, but in the case of a priapism, it cannot leave that corpora cavernosa. And because it cannot leave, there is no inflow of oxygenated arterial blood. When oxygen can't reach tissue, it becomes ischemic and dies. This ischemic priapism is known as low flow priapism or ischemic priapism. But the important thing to understand is that with a lack of oxygen, we get tissue loss. And they say in neurology or urology that time is erectile tissue. In other words, the longer Quentin, if he were to have a sustained priapism, waited to receive medical care, the greater his chances of having erectile dysfunction in the future because that tissue cannot be regenerated. So as you see there in the, in the slide, Physiological changes occur by six hours. There is cellular damage by 24 hours, and then fibrosis by 36. And now you've really lost the capacity of that tissue. What types of drugs can cause this kind of condition? Well, they're listed there for you. But within the realm of um, psychotropics, you want to remember that antidepressants such as bupropion, fluoxetine, sertraline, and lithium can cause priapism in addition to the one we always think about, which is trazodone. And then there are some antipsychotics that can cause priapism and even Hydroxyzine, which is uh, an antihistamine, but that we often use as an anti-anxiety agent. You probably would have predicted that the uh, phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitors um, like uh, sildenafil and um, the others, uh, 
are likely to cause priapism. And you've probably seen many commercials on television where it will say, if you experience a painful, sustained erection uh, that lasts more than four hours, see your doctor. And that is because through their mechanism of action, they have a chance or higher likelihood of producing priapism. It's important to recognize that that is considered a medical emergency. And then don't forget that recreational drugs can also cause priapism. So cocaine, alcohol, marijuana uh, would be drugs that you would want to ask about in a case where an individual presents and you're trying to figure out the um, etiology of that priapism. This slide shows the um, priapism that is most common being the ischemic or low flow. It's the one that we're worried about because it is ischemic. The high flow priapism is relatively rare and it's not typically associated with a lack of oxygen. We just said that drugs uh, can affect or cause this condition either because of their adverse effects or because of their therapeutic effects as in the case of erectile dysfunction or in the case of intracavernosal injections um, for erectile dysfunction. But then there is a medical condition that we see has even a higher chance of producing low flow priapism, and that is sickle cell anemia, more often uh, seen with black males, but is a, um, it makes sense if there is a morphologic change or a disruption in the, um, the blood cell shape, it's more likely to cause flow problems and that's why we often see, or more often see, priapism in individuals who suffer from sickle cell anemia. This is a painful picture for mostly men to see, but it is showing the treatment for priapism. You see here, there is, uh, they're using, in this case, a sympathomimetic phenylephrine. It's the drug of choice and first-line treatment for low-flow priapism. It is injected into the corpus cavernosum. And then there is the aspiration followed by saline irrigation. Of course, we would never be doing this, but it's just something for you to keep in mind what does happen? For example, you may have a patient you're prescribing, say, trazodone to, and you talk about priapism, and they say, well, what should I do? And what will happen after I do go to the ER? Um, and this, it, you may say, geez, I don't know if I really want to get into this level of detail with them. Um, and maybe you don't, but you should at least know what is uh, coming into Quentin's future should you continue to prescribe that trazodone. And in um, most physicians and, and studies would recommend that you not re-prescribe trazodone when you see the beginnings of priapism. He was able to relieve it with his cold showers. Some people relieve it with cold compresses. If it works, great. But once you've heard that that has happened, it's time to stop that medication because it's just not worth taking the choice. There's so many uh, uh, taking the risk. Um, there are so many other medications that you can use that don't cause this type of problem. Let's move on to a less painful topic, erectile dysfunction. The interesting thing about this disorder is if you start out as a psychologist like we all uh, perhaps have, there's an evolution that your thinking may undergo as you learn about this condition. And I hope to take you along with me as we discuss a case and then talk about what tends to cause erectile dysfunction. <laughs> 
This is the case of the CAD, and you'll understand later why I called him a CAD. His name is Mike, and he is a hedonist. He loves to go out to nightclubs, he loves good food, expensive champagne, and adventurous sex. He comes to you for a prescription to help with his inconsistent and sometimes partial erections. What kinds of things should you consider besides a phosphodiesterase inhibitor uh, like tilatophil or a sildenafil? First, let's look at the average male. He is more likely to skip the uh, doctor altogether. He goes to healthcare providers uh, for prevention less often than his female counterparts. He follows medication reg uh, regimens um, more than the average female. Um, to control long-term chronic conditions. He is more likely to ignore symptoms or to delay seeking medical attention when sick or in pain, and is more likely to present for sports injuries, erectile dysfunction, hair loss, and um, needing to urinate too often. But you know, for those other kind of preventive appointments, you're not going to see him as often. Looking at erectile dysfunction, again, we remember the male genitalia from um, our previous discussion of priapism. The important thing to notice here, though, is that segment uh, on your right lower, your lower right, where it shows the normal artery and a narrowing of an artery. Also, I don't know if you can see it with this level of, of uh, discernment, but even if you think about it, the size of a blood vessel that is um, oxygenating the penis is very small in diameter. Now you have, for example, an artery that is being narrowed by cholesterol, and it's a very small, narrow radius to begin with. So why do we bring that up? because erectile dysfunction is a sentinel marker and risk factor for coronary artery disease. And that's why I called this patient a CAD in order to remind you that his erectile dysfunction should be considered a marker for coronary artery disease until proven otherwise. And that's why I say that um, my evolution as a psychologist has really changed because when I uh, first treated patients with this condition, the obvious factor I was considering was a psychogenic uh, reason or cause for the erectile dysfunction. But now with this training, I've learned to really um, not only consider that, but also to consider the importance of cardiac disease in this particular condition. And as you see, I included a quote there where it says, never before has the association of erectile dysfunction or a male sexual dysfunction been so strongly linked as a harbinger of cardiovascular events in men. It's such an important harbinger that it's called the dipstick uh, in urology because when an individual comes in complaining of erectile dysfunction, 
the first thing our urologist is going to consider is whether there are these markers, um, especially if an individual shows some of the obvious signs, like this picture that I included for you in order to kind of sear the thought in your mind. Uh, the individual who's showing this increased abdominal girth and is more likely to be suffering from the effects of metabolic syndrome, which again is associated with erectile dysfunction. We know that with aging, we see an increase in these metabolic syndrome factors like hypertension, diabetes, hyperlipidemia, and obesity. Men complaining of erectile dysfunction should be assessed for these manageable diseases. In addition to uh, defining the specific sexual complaint. So a brief uh, cardiovascular assessment of risk factors should include their smoking, lifestyle and exercise, diet, blood pressure, lipids, weight, and mood. I included this short version of the International Index of Erectile Function, the IIEF5. There's also a 15 question longer version, but the idea is that it allows us to begin to quantify um, the levels of dysfunction. And if you look at the 15, it will actually help. Um, I don't know if you can read that. It's pretty small. But it will actually help to quantify or point in the direction of, for example, psychogenic factors versus um, physical factors. And within those physical factors, subsets of those. So um, it's online. It is available to you at no cost, and it's a nice way to go about objectifying your assessment of the individual who presents with erectile dysfunction. How do the phosphodiesterase uh, 5 inhibitors work? We know them as Cialis and Viagra, um, Levitra. The important thing to keep in mind is that they work off of nitric oxide, just like nitroglycerin. And we know from our understanding of how nitroglycerin works that nitric oxide has the effect of, of uh, relaxing smooth endothelial tissue. It does that through the release of cyclic GMP and as a result, you get a relaxing of that tissue, and that allows blood flow, which then, of course, enhances the erection. I included this as a little um, handout to help you know about the side effects and the dosing of the of at least three agents. We weren't trained in this in the cycle farm demonstration project and I always wish that someone had taught me about um, these conditions and the um, adverse effects of these drugs because of course many times patients seeing these drugs on commercials will come expecting it to be doled out like candy. Um, and sometimes it is, sadly to say. But ho hopefully we as learned providers are going to look at some of the potential adverse effects like the cardiac um, effects with greater scrutiny and consider the fact that, as we said earlier, um, there are lifestyle changes that at the very least should be considered and recommended um, before we kind of knee jerk into just a fix it approach and miss really the grander picture, which is this person is at higher risk for that sudden death that we talked about earlier at the very beginning of this lecture because of their CAD. 
I've included other treatments beyond phosphodiesterase inhibitors. So for example, uh, one thing I do want to point out to you is that in the case of hypogonadism, or you've probably heard it defined or described on commercials as low T, meaning low testosterone, that in these cases, the um, drugs like Viagra and Cialis will not have the intended effect or certainly a suboptimal effect because of the low testosterone. And that needs to be considered as well before going ahead and prescribing these types of medications. Um, I believe in the states that are allowed to prescribe now, um, the, the um, PD-5 Inhibitors are not part of the formulary, but um, it might help you in assisting or consulting in a primary care capacity. There are also other uh, ways of uh, treating the erectile dysfunction, like vacuum tumescent devices, penile prostheses, and of course, what we're used to providing, which is psychotherapy in the cases where the individual may have an anxiety disorder that is affecting their ability to obtain and maintain an erection. Uh, many times we know that relationship issues can be a significant factor. Next and last with, the, with respect to the sex-specific disorders is a premature ejaculation. This actually has undergone its own evolution over the course of my teaching this topic because in the past, what you will see is that, um, well, let me back up a second and just define premature ejaculation. It occurs when male sexual orgasm occurs before he wishes it or too quickly during intercourse to satisfy his partner. It happens in approximately 20% of men, more often in young males. And of course, you may have learned behavioral treatments for treating this condition, primarily the pause and squeeze technique and if you had taken this course uh, about three years ago, I would have taught you that the SSRIs um, are the first line of treatment for this condition, um, almost like Stahl does when he uses, you know, first, second, third line and leads out the psychotherapy, which I think many could argue should have always been the first line treatment, but I was teaching psychopharmacology and so I wanted to treat you the first line psychopharm treatments. In any case, what we have learned, and you'll see how, how I came about finding this later on, but for now, what I can tell you is that SSRIs are no longer considered the first line treatments in the a case of premature ejaculation, and I took a quote to explain to you why. It says, our study revealed detrimental effects of sertraline on some semen parameters. It should particularly be considered in patients who are trying to conceive. It seems that behavioral therapy is a safe method without any side effects on semen analysis parameters. So in other words, what we are saying is that, whereas before we might say, well, here's um, some sertraline, or in my case, I would often use um, paroxetine because it tended to have a more significant effect on ejaculation. Um, now, because we are treating a target population that is more often uh, in their fertile years, we said young males tend to suffer disproportionately from this condition, we may be causing a problem that um, does not need to occur. And so the thinking now 
is that we really should be using these behavioral therapies and not so much considering SSRIs uh, in the treatment of premature ejaculation. Now, is this a long-term effect? Um, if it's just used a few times in order to get the person to a point where they can feel more confident, uh, some would argue they'll still use it and there should be no real uh, significant downside. But I think it's important for you as the clinician to know this information and then to make your own decision. Let's move on now to hormonal contra contraceptives. One thing we should always do, and I did it religiously when treating females, is ask about their form of contraception before considering any form of a psychotropic prescription. We should always treat a woman as if she can become pregnant at any time. Now, if you're dealing with someone who is postmenopausal, of course, that's not a consideration. Um, but short of that, we really need to treat each female as if she has the potential for becoming pregnant. 50% of pregnancies are unanticipated. We said that earlier and we're saying it again to drive home the point that many times you'll be treating someone and you won't be thinking about it and they won't be thinking about it until they come in and announce, oh, I just found out I'm pregnant. Now you have to do some scrambling that you wouldn't have had to do if you had considered this a critical element of your treatment plan. You should document the use of birth control and also encourage the use of folic acid supplementation uh, as part of a multivitamin in all women of childbirth years. I don't mean to teach you about how oral contraceptives work what I do want to teach you about in this class on psychopharmacology is that oral contraceptives can exacerbate or treat depressive disorder. If you recall, I told you earlier that um, there was a lot of anger over my recommendation of using SSRIs as the first line treatment pharmacological treatment for premenstrual dysphoric disorder. And that's because it's considered to potentially have a salubrious or beneficial effect on depressive disorder. However, it can also worsen depressive symptoms. And so you see there under YAS that it says in the package insert, Women with a history of depression should be carefully observed and yes, discontinued if depression recurs to a serious degree. You might say, well, that's an oral contraceptive. Maybe I'll get away with using something different like the NuvaRing or maybe Implanon. But you uh, see there in the slide that it is not a um, fail-safe because, in fact, you can see it with both of those preparations. And so the take-home message here is that we really should assess an individual's reaction um, to oral contraceptives if they're being first started and keep in mind that there's this likelihood for depression. Um, the other one that I would often see is that I would get a, a, my patient coming in and saying my depressive symptoms have gotten worse and of course I'm thinking of you know um, psychosocial factors but because I also know this bit of information, I will ask, have you changed anything by way of your medicines, by way of your contraceptive, 
And many times the answer is, oh yeah, I just started a new one, or oh yeah, you know, this one wasn't um, working for me on side effects, so I started this other one. And now I have something to use as potential fodder for hypotheses about what might be causing that worsening of the depressive symptoms. Another thing you probably will recall is I'm also going to ask about whether there's any um, worsening of the symptoms during that menstrual cycle, as we discussed. So a few things to keep in mind that allow you to more sensitively and knowledgeably address the needs of your female patients. And there it is for you, just in terms of guidelines. It says depressed patients should be asked about symptoms relative to the start of hormonal contraceptives. Did, have they experienced depression on other contraceptives? If depression is resulting from their current contraceptive, you might want to consider switching to a different delivery system, although we already said that is not a fail-safe. Um, the uh, class, which means you might try an unopposed as opposed to um, a, a dual um, action agent. And then um, maybe consider ratio and dosing. But of course, you won't be doing that. That would be more likely their um, primary care or other physician. Women should be informed about potential drug interactions. This is probably one of the most important take-home messages that you can uh, learn from this lecture. So you see there it says that there are drugs that are inducers, and you've learned about that in Psychopharm 101, but now you're applying it to this other class of drugs which can have a significant effect in your patient. Some of our drugs can lower the efficacy and therefore increase the chance of pregnancy. It, it typically happens within about the first week of use, and those drugs include some of the most common ones that you and I may use on a daily basis. Benzodiazepines, diazepam, temazepam, the um, anti-epileptic drugs, carbamazepine, topiramate, oxcarbazepine, phenytoin. We don't normally use phenytoin, but the others. Um, modafinil, provigil. And then there are even herbals. So when your patients say, oh, I'm just taking an over-the-counter herbal, well, look at this. St. John's wort, ginkgo biloba, valerian, some of the most commonly used herbal, over-the-counter, there are no big deal kinds of medications can actually reduce the concentrations of oral contra or of, of contraceptives and therefore enhance the chances of an unplanned pregnancy. Um, inhibitors may cause toxicity and increase in side effects of oral contraceptives. And of course that's important, but not nearly as important as these inducing agents. And now that you've just learned this from the course, if you hadn't already known it, you will uh, look at your um, informed consent on specific drugs. And you'll notice that it will actually have a section, or if it's a good one, it will have a section that speaks directly to this issue of the impact of that agent on the, uh, co the constant blood concentration levels of contraceptives and the chance that it can result in an unplanned pregnancy. And that's what we call informed consent. Next, we'll discuss pregnancy and lactation. This is a very dynamic field. It's constantly changing. 
One fundamental, however, is that all women of reproductive age should be instructed and monitored for their use of birth control. And so uh, I've literally had patients who've told me that they've decided to stop their birth control. And the way I see it, I have to feel comfortable prescribing for that individual. And I have actually had cases where I've said, if you cannot be on a birth control while you're taking this agent, then I don't feel comfortable prescribing for you. That doesn't mean you won't get someone else to prescribe, and I certainly invite you to do that if you prefer, but I will not treat you unless you have this in place. If later on you decide that you'd like to get pregnant, great, then let's plan for that. But the idea being that you do have some say, it's not all patient-centered, and in a case where the stakes are so high, as we'll see in a little bit, it really does um, behoove you to consider where you stand on this and what kind of position you would like to take uh, with regard to women using contraceptives uh, as you treat them. I said this was a dynamic field, and for that reason, I've included resources that you can continue to go to beyond this lecture to help you keep up, uh, to learn about the changes uh, with various agents. Um, and hopefully, you'll keep those for future reference. So what about this pregnancy or prenatal period? I have a woman there who is smoking. And the reason is um, I'm trying to draw uh, the point that pregnancy does not confer protection, um, not just for the conditions that we treat, but to the fetus in terms of the crossover of our agents or other agents like um, nicotine to the fetus. No psychotropic is FDA approved for pregnancy, so don't even look for it. It's not like uh, you're going to find that one magic medication that is good for all women who are pregnant. It just doesn't exist. It's a continuously changing physiological state. And uh, oh, later on, I'm going to show you a graph or a, a diagram that shows exactly what I mean when I say it's a continually uh, changing physiological state. But right now, what I'm showing you is this FDA um, classification system that you're probably already used to. Um, it was uh, started in 1979. And it includes the A, B, C, D, and X categories. X, of course, being a teratogen like thalidomide that results in major malformations. But there were problems with this system. So for example, a drug like Welbutrin started out as a B. When people see Bs, they think, well, if I can't have an A, which you know we are, none of our psychotropics fall under the old A category, but a B, wow, that was better than C. So people started to think, maybe I'll just prescribe bupropion. It was based on a fallacy. Because there was less research on bupropion, and therefore less findings of teratogens, or teratogenicity, people thought it was safer when, in fact, it, it, there was no way to prove that to be the case. Um, we're using now this new labeling system. And instead of A, B, C, D, E, it's actually going to uh, include pregnancy, which is now including labor and delivery. Then lactation, and a new category that is called 
females and males of reproductive potential. This new category is actually what allowed me to find the changes with regard to premature ejaculation and SSRI use because <clears throat> I looked at the package insert for, uh, I, I want to say it was Zoloft or Sertraline, and found out that there was this new label that indicated that males were more likely um, to experience problems with infertility or semen production, I should say, with the use of SSRIs. So these categories, they are not only um, including this new one, but you'll see as I show you some of the um, clinical and treatment guidelines, they offer much more information than a simple A through D and then X labeling system. I think it's going to make our job much easier when it comes to researching and trying to understand the benefits and risks of using various agents with our pregnant patients. So here's a clinical case. Um, it may not happen in this way for you, but it'll, it'll probably happen in some variant of this one. Your patient, Jen, calls you and she sounds distressed. She tells you, I can't get a hold of my primary care doctor. I just read online that the tetracycline I've been taking will cause my baby's teeth to turn yellow or even brown. It's horrible. I don't know what to do. She tells you she is four weeks pregnant according to her doctor's calculation. And you've always heard about this teratogenic effect of tetracycline, but is there anything you can do, any advice you can give her to make her feel better about her situation? Well, first, let's talk about teratogenicity. With no drugs at all, just your uh, baseline population, we are going to see major congenital malformations in the United States at a percentage of three to five. So three, out of five, uh, three to five out of 100 women will, without taking any medicine at all, experience a major congenital malformation in their newborn. Now, this piece of information will help to start guiding your thinking about teratogenicity. Organogenesis, which means the development of organs, occurs or uh, begins from weeks 1 through 12 during the first trimester, we would say. The utero-placental circulation forms in the second week, therefore minimal exposure to drugs before the second week. We know that we just said teratogenicity is most important during that first trimester. Why? Because during that first trimester, you are more likely to have major malformations because that's when the organs are, develop, are starting to develop. But now let's go back to our case. Gestational age is determined by the date of the last menstrual period and not the date of conception. So what that means is that the fetal age is typically two weeks younger than gestational age. That places Jen at two weeks fetal age rather than at what she is telling you, which is that she is four months pregnant. Okay, I, I mean, <laughs> not four months, four weeks pregnant. Let's look at this chart now to help us understand how we might be able to help her. If you look at this chart of fetal development, you see that during those first two weeks, which is where Jen 
actually is. The zygote is just going through the division process. There is no development of organs at this point. What you see there is that the actual organ development is starting at that third week and beyond. And this chart shows you what is developing. So for example, if you look, you'll see that about week uh, six there, um, it's, it's showing that that's when the teeth are developing. Knowing that can help you realize that this problem with the tetracycline should really not be a significant issue in Jen's particular case. Now, whether you're comfortable saying that or leaving that to her primary care doctor and saying it in a more you know, generic way, which is, oh, you're still early on in your pregnancy, let's talk to the doctor, but I don't see this as a significant issue based on where you are in your pregnancy, that's really up to you. But I, I really like this chart because it helps us to begin to see um, time periods and why major malformations occur during that first trimester compared to the rest. Now, does that mean you don't get any malformations in the second and third trimester? Of course not. And as you can see there, um, there are still um, potential for malformations, but they become um, less major as the fetus continues or the embryo and then fetus continues to develop. So let's do just a little summary. The trimesters of risk are particularly significant in the second and third trimester. Um, they are associated with defects and complications for dental staining, and that's what we're talking about here. In her case, we're really worried about that second and third trimester for Jen and her tetracycline. If it were something else, a different drug, we might be worried about um, the first trimester. But remember what we said, she's really in that kind of safe two week period where um, the organs are not um, in their genesis. And then the clinical consideration is that use during the last half of pregnancy is what may cause the permanent discoloration of the teeth. And the class of uh, drugs should not be used during pregnancy, so we know she's going to have to get off of this. But based on what we just learned, we know that her baby is not at risk for this teratogenic effect, at least from our current state of understanding of how teratogenicity works. And Interestingly, I wanted to make sure to include this, the male contribution to teratogenicity. Again, because this new FDA classification system will include that in your package inserts. They have, uh, I think, you know, two or three years to get these um, new classifications in place, depending on when the drug first came out. But in the case of the male contribution, we see that there's, uh, there was one large cohort study suggesting paternal exposure does not appear to directly increase the risk of birth defects. It was based on 340,000 pregnancies evaluated in Norway. And there, uh, the findings was that there was no significant cause of uh, birth defects or adverse pregnancy outcomes in terms of the paternal contribution. What was interesting, though, is that um, teratogen exposures like illicit drugs and alcohol seem to lower the likelihood of a woman either becoming pregnant or um, 
it increased her chances of miscarriage during the pregnancy. Smoking is associated with newborn heart defects and chemotherapy with chromosome defects. Again, in terms of the male contribution. Now, remember when I said that um, there is a dynamic physiological set of changes that occur during pregnancy? Well, this is what um, I was referring to. You see that antidepressant blood levels will actually change over the course of the pregnancy. And so that um, you see kind of a steady decline over the course of the first, second um, trimester all the way through to delivery. And then there's this type of rebound that occurs upon delivery and then back to normal postpartum. This uh, is not with all drugs, obviously, but um, it's, you can use it almost as a template um, for understanding some of the dynamic changes in pharmacokinetics during the course of, uh, of a pregnancy. In this case, it was with um, citalopram and um, escitalopram. What are the different types of adverse outcomes that can occur as a result of a pregnancy? Well, you're probably used to thinking of your basic congenital abnormalities. These are major and minor physical anomalies that are either functional or cosmetic uh, that are most associated, as we said, during that period of organogenesis in the first trimester. However, there are other types of teratogenicities, uh, um, and those are neonatal. We're going to talk about that later when we discuss um, the uh, pulmonary hypertension that we see in the newborn. And then there are neurobehavioral sequelae of using drugs. And those are developmental delays, learning difficulties, or neurological deficits that occur due to an exposure to drugs during pregnancy. But now they're exerting their effects neurobehaviorally after delivery. I included this slide because I know that many of us are very hesitant to even consider using a drug during pregnancy uh, or with pregnant women. And I understand that. I had the same fears um, and really worried throughout the pregnancy, probably just as much as the mom did, because I knew about a lot of the effects that these drugs can have. But this drug, I mean, this graph hopefully will kind of sober or temper your thinking about why we use drugs during pregnancy. It shows the rate of relapse uh, in major depression when an antidepressant is discontinued. So, for example, you see there in the green, uh, in, on the green line, that these are the women who are maintained on their antidepressant during their pregnancy compared to women who are not maintained or who discontinue their antidepressant as a result of their pregnancy. And what you see there is a very clear distinction in terms of the chances of relapse um, the green line stays relatively euthymic, whereas the wom women who have discontinued begin to show a steady decline from the end of the first trimester on. And we know that individuals, or in this case, pregnant moms who suffer from depression, they're going to have 
effects, that depression is going to have an impact on the developing fetus, just like a drug can have an impact on that fetus. This is straight out of the American Congress of the Obstetricians and Gynecologists website. It says, um, well, just big picture, is it's telling you that there are consequences to maternal depression in and of itself. Forget the drugs, just depression itself. You see here it says maternal prenatal stress and depression is associated with low infant birth weight and prematurity. It's associated with uh, preeclampsia and with also risk of birth defects, especially in the cranial neural crest. So we don't get to go off scot-free by thinking that if we just stop the medicine, everything is going to be okay. Because we know that mom has a greater chance of uh, experiencing depression, uh, a relapse of mania, perhaps a relapse of psychosis when they stop the medication that for all intents and purposes is working for them simply because she is pregnant. What about SSRI use during pregnancy? We said earlier that with no medicine, the risk is between 3 and 5%. Well, with SSRIs, it becomes about 7%. So we can say then that the risk from SSRI exposure in pregnancy is small. We're looking at about a 2% increase on average. And we have seen uh, case-controlled studies that reveal an inconsistent result with regard to the pulmonary uh, hypertension and septal defects. Now, we know that this was the case. It was a big hoopla at one point because Paxil and fluoxetine had shown some cases with this, um, with this finding of um, the uh, hypertension of the newborn uh, pulmonary. But these findings have not been consistent. And to the point, let's see if it's on this next slide. Yeah, to the point that the FDA on their, in their MedWatch program in 2012 actually took a stand and said that at this time, the FDA advises healthcare professionals not to alter their current clinical practice of treating depression during pregnancy. And it was because of these inconsistent findings with regard to PPHN of the newborn. Oh, and just uh, if you look there, it's just a quick understanding of PPHN. It's where the infant does not adapt to breathing outside of the, of the womb this obviously then results in hypoxia or a lack of oxygen. And if it is chronic, then it can result obviously in organ damage and potentially even death. It's fatal in about 10% of the cases. But again, as I said, the findings have not suggested that there is enough of a risk of PPHN to alter prescribing habits with SSRIs. Now, have some doctors um, or obstetricians kind of stayed away from paroxetine and fluoxetine because of this? Yes, I have seen that. Um, and how you justify that is really kind of a personal decision with your patient. Um, but it's just important to know that this is an inconsistent finding. With regard to antidepressants and lactation, it's important to understand that 
before about the second or third month, uh, an infant's metabolism is not 100%. And so they are going to be subjected to the passage of whatever that agent is through the breast milk to differing extents depending on the size of the molecule and the um, drug itself. But we can say that in most, with most data, with a full-term infant, because premature babies obviously are not going to have the kind of uh, liver function met met metabolism as a full-term infant, but given a full-term, um, the levels are negligible for most antidepressants. And the adverse effects have been reported with um, doxepin, fluoxetine, and citalopram. So um, that is something to keep in mind when you are considering uh, a mother who is making the decision about breastfeeding. Of course, we know that um, there's a lot of discussion about breastfeeding in uh, new moms. Many times a depressed <coughs> individual is less likely to go through kind of the hard job of, of uh, breastfeeding. There are many kind of obstacles that can present along the way. I had a patient who said she wanted to start a um, support group for women who choose not to um, breastfeed. But bottom line is, um, it's just something to keep in mind that it's not just during pregnancy, it's also during delivery. We're on to now our guidelines for antipsychotics. Probably no one has to tell you the risk of untreated psychosis can be um, severe in terms of the effects not only on the um, person themselves in terms of their symptomatology, but also their relationships with others. The uh, recommendation is that the risk of untreated psychosis be weighed against the relatively rare teratogenic effects of antipsychotics. It's best to avoid depot neuroleptics because of their potential for accumulation and toxicity in the neonate. But there is a risk for a relapse if a person who was previously on a depot neuroleptic is taken off it. So again, something to be considered in terms of risk benefit analysis. And high potency neuroleptics, which is more often um, the distinction we use with the first generation antipsychotics and not so much with the atypicals, um, they are, the high potency are less likely to cause autonomic effects as well as sedation, hypertension, and cardiovascular problems. This is an FDA 2011 update from the FDA. It is with regard to both typical and atypical use in pregnancy. The risk of extrapyramidal symptoms and withdrawal symptoms in newborns whose mother are treated in the third trimester becomes an issue. So what does that look like? It looks like agitation. There can be hypertonia. So um, you've probably heard of that floppy baby syndrome because of the hypertonia. Uh, tremor, somnolence, respiratory distress, feeding problems. Those are those um, neonatal problems that we can see with the use of these drugs. And then, um, toxicity or withdrawal so that when the, we are at the point of delivery and the newborn, um, there can be that drug. Obviously, we said that the drug crosses across the bloodstream. And because of that, if the child 
um, is now uh, self-functioning, independent outside of the womb, it's no longer getting that drug if there's no breastfeeding involved, or sometimes even with breastfeeding because the amount is different or the concentration levels are different, you can see withdrawal in the neonate. The duration and severity can occur um, in terms of uh, low to high, and it can happen from uh, hours to days. In more severe cases, the infant may require um, help or supportive measures in the NICU. Um, and then, of course, there's been some argument that this may be the result of the use of antipsychotics, but there are also confounding factors like concomitant drug use. There's no recommendation to stop, again, by the FDA, but they do encourage uh, discussion um, by the healthcare professional and the patient about the risks and benefits of going forward. Here's a clinical detective for you. You've been prescribing Depakote to a 24-year-old bipolar female for the past year. She has responded well to psychotherapy and has remained stable for the past six months. She has consistently returned for maintenance sessions every two months, and you're quite proud of the strides that you've made together. However, there's always a punchline. During the most recent follow-up, she tells you that she's pregnant, and you learn that she's in her second trimester. What is your thinking? Well, as of 2011, these are the risks associated. For those of you who are going to take the um, psychopharm exam for psychologists, uh, this is a good um, guide for you to keep in mind as you think about the anticonvulsants and their use during pregnancy. As you see, many of them are category D. Remember, that's the old system that we got used to, but it, it has changed. Um, but in the old nomenclature, they are, uh, four of them are category D agents, which means that they are known to be teratogenic. What kinds of teratogenicities? Lithium, which is kind of the gold standard that we use with bipolar patients. It is uh, likely to produce Epstein's anomaly, floppy baby syndrome. Um, there's been, you know, a accumulation of data that uh, helps us to put it, the Epstein's anomaly into greater perspective. It's not as high as we once thought, but it still has to be considered as a possible teratogenic effect of lithium. The um, carbamazepine, which is CBZ, can result in um, the uh, fetal hydantoin syndrome, but the one that we try to kind of remember across the board with these like carbamazepine and valproate are the neural tube defects. So that's something to just keep in mind. It's easy to remember that um, those are uh, primarily associated with spina bifida. And then um, topiramate, increased cleft palate, lamotrigine, increased cleft palate, unsafe with breastfeeding. Gabapentin, uh, one report of respiratory distress. So we see that there's a reason these agents are more troubling uh, to use during the, uh, the pregnancy. And they are certainly things to be considered and discussed with the patient as we decide how to move forward when she discovers that she is pregnant 
while taking one of these agents. So we're bringing her back, this, um, the case. We would say that valproate should not be administered to a woman of childbearing potential unless the drug is essential to the management of her medical condition. Remember I told you that we get a lot more data now from the FDA categories? These that I've included are just a couple. They're just enough to kind of whet your appetite to start to look more in depth at the package inserts and how they are changing for the better because now we're getting some real data. So for example, the risk summary is that the trimesters of risk for valproate are across the board, first, second, and third trimester. So once we see that third trimester, we also know there are probably going to be some neurobehavioral sequelae from using this drug. We already talked about the spina bifida as being a consideration, but there are others like um, mid-facial hypoplasia, deficient orbital ridge, prominent forehead, congenital heart disease, and decreased postnatal growth. Unless other treatments have failed to provide adequate symptom control, we really should be looking at other agents. Um, recommended prenatal diagnostic testing. So in other words, if a patient, let's say, is taking um, valproate, and they discover they've become pregnant, like in the case of this individual who was already taking the drug and doing well with it, then we can test for these neurotube defects. And of course, that would happen in concert with the obstetrician who would order the study. But at least we now have the ability to take a look at that and maybe ease some of her concerns. It's also the reason why we talked earlier about making sure that there is folate supplementation because we know that um, folate deficiencies are uh, more associated with risk for um, neurotube defects. What about benzodiazepines? The old category, according to the FDA, was that it was a D or an X. I remember when I was first learning um, how to prescribe in pregnancy, we had a woman who was suffering horribly intense, severe panic attacks, and she had to be hospitalized because her anxiety was so bad. And I remember the psychiatrists who were supervising me deliberating about what to do. And they literally used a barbiturate rather than to prescribe her a benzodiazepine for that anxiety. And the reason is just because of what you see there, that they were D or X category. Now, using the new system that I told you about, we get this extra information that shows risk summary. So the trimesters of risk, again, they're from the first to the third trimester. Um, especially for flurazepam, temazepam, and triazolam, which used to be not D, but category X drugs. The clinical considerations are that they should be avoided in pregnancy. I've already said that. That only if the benefits outweigh the risks, and I will tell you that you'll be hard pressed to find a prescriber who believes that the benefits uh, outweigh the risks. It would be a very rare case. The third trimester exposure, especially for benzodiazepines that have a long half-life are likely to cause problems in the neonate. So that would include hypotonicity, that floppy baby syndrome that I talked about, um, a failure to feed, and even apnea, which you probably could have predicted in the sense that we know that benzodiazepines cause central nervous system depression and in very high doses can result in uh, breathing suppression, and that's why in very high doses they can lead to death. 
Um, but in the neonate, it can result in these periods where they stop breathing or apnea. And then also low APGAR scores, which are used to kind of rate the, um, the uh, functionality of the newborn. Um, and then the uh, major consideration with benzodiazepines are that oral cleft palate. Uh, this is the one that we're always quizzed on and that we always uh, try to remember for tests and such. But remember, you know, those other things are just as important and we want to keep them in mind as we're um, making a decision about how to proceed with the treatment of anxiety in the pregnant patient. So here are the guidelines. Um, withdrawal symptoms in the neonate. We know that they can withdraw just like uh, the person who's literally taking the, um, I shouldn't say literally because the infant is literally taking it because of that crossover of drug to the, to the embryo. Um, but because of that, we can get these withdrawal symptoms such as irritability, hyperactivity, disturbed sleep, and tremors. If use is unavoidable, uh, high doses should be avoided as well as short-acting benzodiazepines. We've kind of just scared you a little bit about using these agents, but it's just as important to remember that if a female is taking a benzodiazepine and discovers she's pregnant and she's been on this drug for a long time, you know, months, we don't want to suddenly stop that medicine because it can result in seizures. A pregnant woman with seizures is another risk. So, don't be too quick to make a decision to stop a benzodiazepine. Remember the negative uh, potential for withdrawal and then be more careful about making sure that that drug is tapered slowly. And then attempt a full taper prior to delivery if you haven't been able to do that earlier. Again, because of those neonatal um, after effects. Once delivery has occurred, we know that there is a risk for depression, um, postpartum depression. It's the most common complication of childbearing. Oftentimes it's called the baby blues, but in more severe cases, it goes beyond the blues and can actually result in risk to the mother and then also to the newborn. One of the instruments that I'm used to using through our primary care clinic and that you may want to consider using if um, you do any work with either obstetricians or primary care doctors um, is the Edinburgh Postnatal Depression Scale or EPDS. It's a great way to identify patients at risk for perinatal depression. It's easy to administer, quick, quick to take. Um, you can reproduce it without paying, so it's free. Um, and mothers are asked to check the response that comes closest to how they've been feeling in that past week. So in other words, it's really based on the last seven days um, rather than asking them how they've been doing over a month or so. And it's done at each follow-up appointment. That's just a picture of it, so you can see it. Um, and some of the questions, you probably uh, won't be able to see it uh, because of the small letters. But um, if you go online and you just look under Edinburgh Postnatal Depression Scale. You'll find it, you can print it out and have as many copies as you want. This is the scoring, which I'm not going to go over. Um, but the one thing I will uh, alert you to is that a score above 13 
suggest the, uh, that the mother is suffering from some form of depression. And that means you should explore further uh, and not just let her kind of go about her business without trying to see if there's some intervention that would help her. Um, this is back to lactation in terms of guidelines. The uh, amount of benzodiazepine that gets expressed through the breast milk is actually pretty small. And although it's not likely to be a significant threat to the infant, it's really still best to avoid benzodiazepines during or uh, when a mother is breastfeeding, again, because of the sedation, the apnea, the kinds of uh, neurobehavioral impact. And if benzodiazepines are continued during lactation, of course, you should use the lowest effective dose. Some have suggested that uh, the female express milk um, after the um, initial dosing, and that way she's kind of eliminating the biggest bolus of the drug, and therefore when she expresses afterwards, it's less. Um, there's controversy about whether that really makes enough of a difference. My tendency is not to prescribe benzos, period, because there's so many better behavioral treatments, um, but it's just something to keep in mind if you do prescribe them. And then the guidelines for uh, lactation with the mood stabilizers. You can also see that floppy baby syndrome when, when breastfeeding on um, drugs like carbamazepine, valproate, oxcarbazepine. Babies should be monitored up to 10 days after birth. It can affect neonatal thyroid function. Um, and that's probably going to be more the case with lithium. There are no neurobehavioral or developmental anomalies uh, compared to non-exposed infants at five-year follow-up, so that's um, op uh, helpful and somewhat optimistic. But really, lactation is contraindicated with these agents. And so the recommendation is to kind of help the mom understand that um, sometimes lactation is not as helpful as it can be for women who are not taking these drugs because it can have a negative impact on the newborn. Electrolytes pass easily into milk. The average 40 to 50 percent of the drug, on average, 40 to 50 percent is found in the maternal serum, and there is risk for lithium toxicity. So again, you know, all things being equal, you probably want to stay away from breastfeeding with mothers on mood stabilizers. And some of these things are probably kind of common sense. The exposure is going to be dependent on dosage. So very minimal dose means minimal exposure. Uh, how often the drug is taken and when? Is it right you know, before she, when it's at its C-max and she's now breastfeeding? Or um, is she at a steady state of this drug, at which point it really doesn't matter whether she just um, took the drug or not? And then, of course, how quickly the mother metabolizes the medication. In an earlier lecture, I talked about a mother who was a rapid metabolizer taking codeine for episiotomy pain. And because she was a high a rapid metabolizer, she was actually biotransforming the codeine into morphine. And because of that rapid rate of metabolizing the codeine, the infant became toxic. It was receiving toxic levels of that drug. And as a result, it died. So that was an infant fatality 
that was based on the mother's rate of metabolism, she did not receive any higher dose than anyone else who takes the average uh, dose of codeine. But that metabolizing rate of hers is what resulted in the death of her newborn. So something that's pretty important to keep in mind. Always use the minimum effective dose. Only infants born at term without organ dysfunction affecting metabolism or clearance. So in other words, kidney function should be exposed to medication. And then there should always be monitoring by both the doctor and the parent to look for those um, changes in the newborn. This next set of slides are really to help you as you do your decision making and collaborating with your patient and their family or partner um, with regard to using medications during, and, uh, during pregnancy and postnatally. So we want to do a risk-benefit analysis and again, my, my um, norm is to ask the partner to come in and to be part of that session to help both of them make decisions about how to proceed. Of course, if it's a single parent, you know, you may have other relevant or significant people in their lives that might benefit from it as well. It's ultimately her choice to make but I really try to get as many kind of minds to help in the decision making as seem relevant um, in each particular case. We should not only talk about the risks benefits of a particular drug or lack of the drug, we should talk about alternatives that are available. In particular, um, psychotherapy, which is and may be an alternative, which I've used on many occasions successfully, but that really depends on the severity of the depression and the frequency of recurrence in that particular individual. We should know the side effects and adverse effects of drugs used in pregnancy. We should always obtain informed consent. In other words, not only speak to the individual, have them relate back to us, their understanding of what we said and how we educated them. And then finally, probably the least important, even though it tends to be kind of high on the provider's list of things to get, is that signature at the end of the informed consent document. Because I will tell you, and legal experts will tell you, that that signature is not worth half as much as that collaborative stance that you take with the patient so that you are both making the decision and you are both in agreement about how you're proceeding so that if anything goes wrong later on, you at least are a team. You haven't kind of broken into camps, uh, opposing camps you've actually come to a decision together. And that collaboration is what reduces lawsuits. It's not that signature at the end of the form. And of course, you're not out there alone. Don't take this on as your individual cross to bear. This woman is going to be more than likely seeing not only a primary care doctor, but an obstetrician. And those are your consultants as you are treating. They should be kind of on your speed dial because if you're treating a, a woman um, who is taking a medication uh, in pregnancy, then you should be on board with their obstetrician as well. Many times I haven't even been the one doing the prescribing. I've actually just helped the obstetrician um, to either make decisions or changes, but they've really been the ones that were holding the stick. So, um, you know, something important to keep in mind. And then obviously document, 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 which you've probably grown nauseous of hearing at this point. So I don't feel like I need to go over that. 
This slide takes us into the specifics of what constitutes a risk-benefit analysis. So we talk about risk-benefit. How do we actually do that? Well, we start by uh, weighing factors. For example, what condition are we treating? So that, let's say you're dealing with a mild depression. Do you really want to use a drug that has potential for teratogenicity in the treatment of that depression? Or might you be better off treating with behavioral therapy? Most would argue that if it's a mild depression, you're really, your risk-benefit analysis should steer you in the direction of using therapy, uh, behavioral therapy. Then what's the patient's history? So for example, if they um, have had a history of maybe um, more moderate to severe depression and they're just in the mild stage right now, do they um, tend to have recurrences that uh, happen monthly? Do they have severe depression that recurs, that results in suicidality? Now, those kinds of historical details of the patient's history are going to be important as you make a, your risk-benefit analysis. Remember that recurrence of depression, of mania and psychosis, not only affect the mother, but can have actual teratogenic effects on the fetus as well. You should uh, have other interventions that have been considered or uh, at least in the course of your risk-benefit analysis, you should offer an array of various treatments that can treat the condition at hand. Also, if an individual has done well with a particular medication, even if it is teratogenic, if the history shows that when she has stopped that medication, she's had a severe um, manic episode or severe manic episodes, psychosis, now that has to be included in your risk-benefit analysis, and it's not so clear-cut. What are the risks of not treating, again, to the mother and to the fetus? We already talked about which medications has she responded to. Are there other medications with the same indication but a safer track record that you might switch to? So for example, like we said with valproate, um, might we use something that has less risk? And then how is the uh, patient's and provider's understanding and value system affecting decisions about the use of medication? So for example, I will tell you from a personal uh, just perspective that I had a really hard time prescribing for my patients who were depressed in pregnancy, and that often had to do with my own personal bias as a psychologist, and I had to learn that, yes, my thoughts and my degree of comfort was an important factor in the risk-benefit analysis, but it was just as important to stay objective, to consider what that woman and her partner, if available, wanted and thought was necessary over the course of the pregnancy. So a great example would be um, me saying, well, you know, let's think about whether we want to continue this medicine. And the woman might say, yeah, I think I want to stop this medicine. And then her partner comes in because, as I said, I, in most cases, I do bring the partner in to discuss the risk benefits. And he might say to me, no way do I want to stop this medicine. My vote is that she stay on it. And that's because she is um, severely depressed to the point of suicidal. I've seen it. I've seen how unstable she becomes. I'd be afraid of my developing baby in her body 
with the kinds of symptoms she shows when she is off of medicine. And guess what? That becomes an important factor that needs to be added to our risk-benefit analysis as we're weighing factors and their importance in how to go forward with to use drug or not to use drug during a pregnancy. And um, we've already talked that the FDA has this new categorization that's going to give you a whole lot more data, and it's already giving you a whole lot more data to use in your decision making um, in the product labeling. And then it will even look at the likelihood of relapse during um, pregnancy and lactation. Um, but you're going to want to look at that in terms of um, your prescribing and risk-benefit analysis. Of course, there are always limitations of current research, and that has to be considered when you're making decisions. We already said that 3 to 5 percent of infants with no medication at all will um, experience birth defects. And then, as we said, these alternatives, particularly psychotherapy, but I've included some others for you to consider. For example, exercise is known to have a significant impact or benefit to depression. There's bright light therapies, omega-3 fatty acids. So again, you know, it's not just one or the other. We need to look at the vast array of different alternatives as we move forward. Let's see, I'm not going to go over all of these because I've kind of talked about the importance of bringing in the partner, um, how empathic and supportive the partners are. Um, so for example, will they reliably ab assist with monitoring? For example, let's say you decide that you want to try maybe reducing the dose, which is often what I would do during a pregnancy rather than stopping a medication. After looking at the history, I would see, is it possible in this case to reduce the dosage? Well, if you have a partner who um, is constantly gone and she's kind of at risk for maybe not following up with you if she gets worse, you may need to bring that into the mix as you're doing your risk-benefit analysis. Do you want to take a chance? on lowering that dosage if you don't have a reliable partner. But let's say you do. Now you can kind of say, listen, I'm going to lower this dose. Would you be able to kind of watch and help me help her as we go along throughout this pregnancy so that we can be quick to make changes as we need to before they become bigger and bigger um, to the point that now she or the baby is at risk? See the difference? It's the idea of working collaboratively with the parties involved so that you're not carrying this burden all by yourself. Um, is there a solid and comfortable relationship with her obstetrician? And how willing is the obstetrician to collaborate with regard to medications and the indicated studies, like if you need to kind of tap them and say, oh, you know, is it possible to, to look at her uh, risk for bina, uh, spina bifida, um, can we do a study to determine whether that's already a risk for her, or, or already um, uh, at an adverse effect from this drug with this particular patient? So you always want to be keeping that collaboration going with other providers. We already said um, the alternatives can even be no medication. But we know that there are risks to that, and not only to the mother, but to the child. However, we should discontinue non-essential, possibly offending agents. So for example, we know that mothers are counseled not to drink alcohol during their pregnancy. We may consider whether um, Antidepressants may be the culprit for mania, and if that's the case, then we probably do want to stop the antidepressant during the pregnancy and see if that's 
uh, if it's possible to kind of guide her through the pregnancy without it. Um, beta blockers, they are typically not um, significant players in terms of reducing anxiety, for example, and they can even have depressogenic effects. So if we see that uh, a mom a woman who's taking a beta blocker, perhaps for hypertension, is showing uh, depression, maybe it might be worth your while to take a look at whether um, you could advise the physician who's treating with the beta blocker to try something else. Um, these are all ways that we play clinical detective when we're treating the pregnant patient that helps to increase our chances of a positive outcome. Now we've reached the wrap-up or conclusion of the course. These are kind of the take-home points that I've tried to distill for you. We know that sex and gender differences exist in medicine. We also know that women show a particular vulnerability when it comes to pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics. That contraceptives are important players, both in terms of um, reducing the chances of unplanned pregnancies, but then also in terms of their potential impact on causing depression or depressed mood. We have looked at the question of continuing medications during pregnancy and lactation, and we understand that it's a dual spectrum kind of issue. On the one hand, you have the chances of causing teratogenicity by the use of an agent that causes teratogen, but at the, that is a teratogen, but at the same time, we can also see that there are teratogenic effects from not using an agent. And that's why we have to always do an individual risk-benefit analysis with each person. Then let's shift over to men. They show greater risk of death from disease. They are also more likely to be misdiagnosed. So for example, that anger discontrol um, rather than being diagnosed as a form of depression. Um, and maybe rather than being treated, the individual might be incarcerated um, because it's not really understood what is behind all that anger. Um, and so we want to be sensitive about asking questions and understanding that men display their symptoms in different ways than women because they've been taught those gender roles to be stoic, to have that stiff upper lip and maybe not describe their sad mood and their tearfulness. And then finally, we should consider individual and sex differences always in order to ensure that we're providing optimal care. I hope that you've enjoyed this lecture on sex and gender and psychopharmacology and that it has a significant impact on your clinical posture and treatment plans. Thank you.